I'm going to try and time this so I don't run out of time because I, I like to talk a lot. Is it possible to turn the lights down a little bit? Just so just this shows up a bit better? Uh, yeah, as Rob mentioned, um, you know, obviously this is a shot of Edmonton at night, all lit up. This is the outline of the talk tonight. Um, we're going to talk first about deregulated electricity because it, you, unless you understand kind of the basics of it, it's really hard to talk about how that impacts your utility bill and then how you can save money using renewable energy. So I apologize for the complexity of the topic. Uh, I didn't choose this method for the electricity sector, but you know, I'm going to try and simplify it as much as possible. So I'm going to gloss over a few things. We're not going to get into the total depth of the deregulated electricity energy. Uh, sector. And I apologize to anybody who happens to be an engineer in the crowd and wants to, you know, talk to me later about some of the details I may have glossed over. But uh, in the, um, you know, we have to do this in an hour and a half or so. So we, we basically have two hours. And so I'm going to, if somebody wants to ask me a question, you go ahead. We have a microphone up here for after when I'm done. You can certainly stand up to the mic and ask a question as well. We are video recording this and it's going to be on YouTube as well, okay? And uh, uh, the presentation will be posted on, our, on the CISO website as well after I'm done. Um, okay. So this is probably what most people have as a perception of the deregulated electricity system in Alberta, that it's kind of geared towards the uh, corporate multinationals that are, you know, controlling the consumers. And it's not without, um, some validity, but I would argue that actually there's a lot of strengths to the deregulated market. And so one of the strengths we have in Alberta, I think, is that uh, we do have this kind of entrepreneurial um, spirit. Um, and deregulation does allow us to do a few things there that uh, you wouldn't be allowed to do in other jurisdictions. This is a starting point. I'm not sure what people think might be the cheapest form of energy. Does anybody want to care to guess what they think it might be? Solar? Oh, that's probably a good starting point for it. But it's actually efficiency, it's something we don't talk about very much. Um, if you don't turn on the light, it doesn't cost you anything. So it's free that way. If you put in more efficient light bulbs, you actually reduce your consumption. You pay for that consumption. So if you're reducing that, you're actually saving money. You're reducing your cost. <clears throat> So I'm not, this is, I'm not going to talk about this too much tonight, but really, seriously, this is where a lot of costs lie. We waste, well, we consume a lot of energy in North America compared to the rest of the world, but typically we waste, for residential customers, we're probably wasting around 30% of our energy. Just poof, wasted. Lots of reasons for that, okay? So it's something we should pay attention to. I, <clears throat> I have a solar customer I just installed a system for. Uh, they had a heat exchanger uh, with a fan running and uh, they didn't, weren't operating it properly. And so just by teaching them how to use a thermostat better, they cut about 25% off their electricity bill and reduced the cost of their solar PV system by about $7,000. And it didn't cost them anything. They just had to use the thermostat right. So it's a topic that, um, that's all I'm going to talk about it, but it's something I wanted to put in people's minds. So here's some of the players within the system. There's more than this, but uh, it's only a tiny slide, so I couldn't put everybody in here. I think probably everybody knows EPCOR. Um, they provide us with electricity, water, sewer, garbage. Well, they don't do garbage, but um, they were <clears throat> the first publicly owned utility in Canada by a municipality, and uh, they're since not, but uh, ish, sort of. Uh, the Alberta Utilities Commission, they are the regulator for uh, the utilities in Alberta. So any charges that are under the regulated side, they have to approve, okay? Uh, anybody that doesn't live in the city of Edmonton but lives in the surrounding area is probably serviced by Forest. Alta Link is the company that builds a lot of the transmission lines in Alberta, okay? Um, does anybody know who Capital Power is? No? So when they brought in um, deregulation, EPCOR used to be one company, uh, what they call vertically integrated. <clears throat> did the generation, did the transmission, 
sent you the bill, took care of the whole thing for you. When deregulation came along, they split it up. Now you have three parties in there. You have a company that generates electricity, you have a company that transmits electricity, and you have a company that sends you your bill. Okay? So what Capital Power is now, EPCOR, Generation, sold off all their assets to what is now called Capital Power. So Capital Power actually owns the generation stations. Okay? It's a separate company. Do you, does everybody know that we have a utilities consumer advocate in Alberta? If you have a problem with utility, you can contact these people and they'll help you. Somewhere. We also have this MSA, which is not like the NSA in the States. This is slightly different. This is a market surveillance administration. They actually keep track of the players within the market to make sure everyone's playing fair. They're actually in court at the moment with TransAlta. They've uh, charged TransAlta with manipulating the market. So there's a, a court process right now, and I'm not sure when it will ever end, but they're being accused of overinflating the price of electricity by turning off generation at the time of peak demands and turning it back on, um, and by this way, driving up the price of electricity. Okay? And so it's a fairly significant uh, uh, lawsuit. It's, it's, I think, $160 million or something like that. So it's, it's not a small amount. This here is uh, an important player in Alberta. Nobody knows who this is. Alberta Electric System Operator. Has anybody ever heard of them? You have? You, what are you, an electrician? Or? I work for ACO. Oh, I work for ACO. <laughs> I'll have to say nice things about ACO. Yeah, so what this is, is this is a nonprofit organization. And they're actually tasked with the job of ensuring that we have a transmission system that's reliable, and that with the growth in our economy and the growth in our population that we they plan out expansion of the grid and stuff like this, okay? So that's, I'm gonna refer to these guys a lot today. Uh, this isn't actually a company down here, this AIES. It's uh, Alberta Integrated Electrici Electricity System. It's just a fancy word for the grid, okay? Um, these guys can't help but refer to it, stuff like that, but. So this is a publication that the AESO makes. It's a public, it's a quarterly, uh, I think it's quarterly, they pr uh, produce this. And you can get it online. They also mail it out. It's a very good graphic that it kind of explains the basics. So the intent of the talk tonight is to make this very simple. It's not intended for people who are engineers or electricians or work for ATCO. It's for people who really don't understand the system at all, okay? So I'm trying to simplify this for you guys. It's a very good graphic. It shows here, basically, here's a homeowner. They actually happen to have solar panels on their house, um, a farm with windmills, office building. The little yellow lines is the distribution network. Over here, we have some generation. We have a hydro dam, windmills, coal plant, biogas. And then we transmit it through these big lines. We've all seen them, these big metal towers with the wires on them. And they go through. Um, the province and uh, distribute the electricity and they come to something what's known as a substation which changes the voltage levels. So basically to transmit electricity in a long distance you want a high voltage. When it gets close to the city we start to lower the voltage down. When we get into this system in here we're basically into the distribution network. So there's transmission and then there's distribution. So distribution is basically within the city, something like that. So if you live in an older neighborhood and you have an alley there's little wooden poles in the back with this garbage can on the top. That's a little transformer. That's part of the distribution network, okay? In terms of generation, we basically have three kinds of generation. This isn't unique to Alberta. This is true of the whole system. It's the way that it kind of evolved when it first was established. In the beginning, um, Thomas Edison wanted to have a DC system. The problem with DC is you, in those days, you couldn't transmit it very far, so you had to have a coal plant on every corner of every block. And uh, the people who lived in those cities didn't think that was such a great idea. Uh, you know, George Westinghouse had a better idea, or a different idea. He wanted alternating current. And so him and Nikola Tesla developed uh, this basic system that we have today. And so this is one of the challenges that we have, is that the fundamentals of the system is actually quite old, technically. You know, you wouldn't have a computer that's 150 years old. You would just laugh at that. But that's what our electricity system is based on. So in terms of generation, we have what's known as a base load generation. <clears throat> in Edmonton, we have a lot of that here. The tradition is they're a thermal plant, which means that they basically create heat, boil water. The, the boiling water creates steam. The steam turns a turbine. The turbine generates electricity. Um, 
They're very reliable. One of the problems with them is you can't turn them off. If you put a tea kettle on your, your stove, you'll know once the water boils, it boils for quite a while. And so they're difficult to turn on and off a lot. So they basically run all the time. That's the way they're designed. The, the efficiency that they tweak out of it over the years is geared towards that. And so uh, that's why they're called a base load. And so they run at night. They crank it up a little bit during the day, but they can't crank it up a lot because they have to crank it down at night again. And so they crank it up and down a little bit, depending on the demand, okay? So their base load can be coal, could be nuclear, could even be hydro if you live in Quebec or BC, someplace where they have a lot of it. You can do base loads with that as well. Um, intermediate generation. So one of the problems with electricity, the system is there's no storage. We don't have any batteries. <clears throat> so the way it works is when you need more electricity, they turn up the heat, boil some more water. We need less electricity to turn off the heat, let it calm down a bit. Uh, these periods when it's going up and down, it's really difficult to manage. And so the system has kind of evolved where they have um, these things that they can kick in and kick out all the time. And so they try and do a lot of forecasting and figure out when the demand's going to occur and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so we have this intermediate generation. <clears throat> Generally is for the daytime loads. Don't tend to use as much electricity at night when you're sleeping as when you're in, at work during the day. And so everybody realizes we use more electricity during the day. And so they have this intermediate generation. And then they have what's known as a peak generation. Because there's certain times of the day, especially in the afternoon, summertime, for instance, if we have a lot of air conditioning and stuff like that, if it's a hot, humid day, in the afternoons we start to get more electricity consumption. And so we have what's known as a peak demand. Okay? Even though it's a brief period, they still build generation for that. They only use it during peak periods. The entire transmission network is designed for the peak, okay? And so it's overbuilt. And everybody pays for that. That's the way the system is, okay? It's a shared cost. And so they really do build it out and they kind of overdo it because if you don't have it big enough and robust enough, then you start to get blackouts, grid crashes, things like this, okay? In Alberta, this is from the AESO as well, some pie charts, to kind of show you the generation mix that we have currently. This is a report that they do every two years. They do what's known as a long-term forecast, where they make this 300-page long report, and they forecast the way the world's going to be in 15 or 20 years and how we're going to get there. The one challenge with this, because it's Alberta, there is no climate change policy input to this. And they clearly state that in the report. Okay? They do not take the effect of climate change <clears throat> into consideration when they made this report. So it's basically business as usual. Okay? And the reason for that, and they state it in the report, is that there is no policy. Alberta doesn't have a climate change policy and the federal government doesn't have a climate change policy. So they're just going with what they know. Okay? In the United States, where we have a very similar mix. They have a little bit more nuclear than we have here. Of course, we don't have any in Alberta. But uh, they have predominantly the electricity generation is from coal. And it is here in Alberta as well. So today, for the province of Alberta, as of the end of 2011, 46% of our generation comes from coal. 28%, I think that's eight. 28% comes from cogeneration. Cogeneration is a, a method of generating you're creating heat to heat a building, and then you have all this excess heat. And rather than waste it, they make electricity with, it, with the extra. And so you're doing two things at once, creating heat, making electricity, so cogeneration. So that's the term for it. Generally, natural gas in Alberta doesn't have to be, though. The other one is combined cycle. This is a natural gas uh, generation. And um, when, they, when they talk about cycles, when they combine cycles, it becomes more efficient. So this is a little bit more efficient type of natural gas uh, generation and then, then a simple cycle. And um, then we have some hydro, some wind, and some other. Solar would be in other. But it doesn't show up on the map so far. In terms of Alberta, what's unique about hydro in Alberta, hydro dams are not built for hydro, hydroelectricity in Alberta. They're built for irrigation, flood control those kinds of things. And since you're building a dam anyways, well, what the heck, let's build some hydro and electricity into it as well. But in terms of when you want them to produce electricity, they first have to make sure they have enough water for their other 
priorities. Irrigation, flood control. That takes priority over generating electricity. So what this is, <clears throat> this is installed capacity. So that's how big the system is. They may never use it, okay? So it's important to note with hydro in particular. It's true with wind as well, but I took that slide out because I was afraid I'd spend too much time on it. So the AESO chops up the province into five zones, which is kind of self-intuitive. There's one zone up north, Fort McMurray. Another one in the northwest, Peace River area, north. Edmonton's in the center. And of course we have the, I don't know what that is, south-ish, middle, and in the south, the center, south center, whatever. So Edmonton is the only part of this that actually generates more electricity than they use, okay? We generate more than twice what our peak demand is. Our peak demand generally is in the wintertime. We also have a peak in the summertime, but our bigger peak is usually in the wintertime. So we actually generate more than twice what our peak would be. So our regular day-to-day -day use, we might generate two and a half, three times as much coal. So the only thing that really matters about this is there's a lot of pollution from coal, carbon footprint, health effects, stuff like that. So we're basically generating most of all of our electricity in the Edmonton region from coal. Locally, we're suffering the effects of that environmentally, and it's being exported basically to our fellow people in the province, fellow citizens in Alberta, uh, to help with their baseload demands, okay? In the Edmonton region, east of us, west of us, sorry, west of us in Wobman, it's located 13 coal plants. It's kind of hard to see that because they call it um, Genesee, Keep Hills, Sundance. Well, Genesee is three, Keep Hills is three, Sundance is seven. They uh, plan on, the older ones that were there, were owned by TransAlta, they've decommissioned those, the ones that were actually in the town of Wobbleman, and so those have all been decommissioned, and uh, the other ones are across the lake. And so um, they're planning on building gas generation there in the future, but also at the same time, they're, ex oops, they're expanding the uh, coal mine as well. So they have an approved coal mine expansion as well. So they clearly aren't giving up on coal either. Uh, in terms of the local area, also ATCO has a, uh, it's a Scotchford upgrader plant. They have a gas um, generation as well. We do have coal generation in the city. It's probably too many for me to go through on this topic, but um, that's, there's a big growth area in coal generation, obviously price of gas is favorable to that. In terms of microgeneration, this really applies to renewable energy. The microgeneration regulations, which I'll talk to later, only is, applies to renewable energy sources. So in the Edmonton region, we have 220-ish within a couple of weeks ago in the Edmonton area and about 1,000 in the whole province. So this is from this summer. <clears throat> some things we see in the news, probably the only time we actually care about the grid or, you know, any of this stuff. You know, we're gonna start playing on the news. Um, and if you're living a high rise and you get caught in an elevator when the power goes off, you actually really care about this. But, um, you know, a couple of headlines, we're asked to conserve energy, we're under heat advisory, so we're asked to watch power uses. And there's another um, headline I pulled from uh, uh, the press as well where the International Energy Agency, that's these guys here, have, for, have predicted that solar will be the largest source of uh, energy in the, in the globe by 2050. So that's clearly where it's going. So in terms of this actually day in history, I thought I'd pull this off the AESO data for everybody, just to bore you all to death. But this is all readily available here. And so what it does is it kind of outlines, these are all the coal plants all the gas plants, and it, the list goes way down here, I cut it off. Uh, hydro, wind, okay? So you actually get a, a breakdown of the big, the big systems, okay? Uh, up here, they lump it all together. So from this day when they were warning of we're gonna have power shortages, the grid's gonna be under you know, stress, please cut down on use. Uh, we see here that coal potentially could have cranked out 6,200 megawatts and it produced uh, 4,700. Uh, the, the gas kicked in with 3,600, hydro kicked in with 245, um, other, it's 253, I think other also must be biomass. Any Rob? Yeah, it's gotta be biomass. 
And wind, uh, 22 out of 1,400, okay? Uh, this other column here, this DCR, is a term I'm not going to talk about because you have to be a super energy geek to really care about that. It's the way they manage the grid. They, they ask people to keep stuff in reserve in case they have an unexpected demand and they can just pull this on. So they have loads they can shut down fast and demand and supply they can bring on fast, okay? And they, they incentivize either suppliers or consumers to do this for them. And so they need this sometimes because there's no battery. If the, if the demand drops, the whole thing can go nuts. So then they, they drop the supply. And so they need to do this quickly sometimes. The other thing over here is the interchase. If I was to go back to the map, it shows, um, maybe I'll go back, to, oops, this one. This is an interchange to BC, here it's called a tie line. So we transfer power between Alberta and BC, and we transfer power between Alberta and Saskatchewan, and between Alberta and Montana. This is an inner ties. Now the way electricity works is it kind of goes to the closest source. So these inner ties don't really help us much up here. And actually, because we net generate, it doesn't actually matter because we're sending it out from where we are. But in terms of this day, when they're warning us that we're gonna have a power shortage and stuff, we're actually selling power to BC, and we're selling power to Montana, but in Saskatchewan, it's kind of a draw, okay? So there's some interesting statistics from that. In terms of solar itself, this is a thermal map, or solar radiation map, and uh, it's pretty common within the industry that we use this data, but if, for somebody who's never seen it before, it's, it's kind of interesting. The colors here are the cooler colors. Blue means you uh, produce less power from, this, from the sun. So it's kind of a strange concept. The sun is the same everywhere in the world, but what's between us and the sun is the clouds. And so in some parts of the world, it's obviously cloudier than other parts of the world. We kind of know this intuitively, living in Alberta, it's a very sunny place and things like that. But here it shows it uh, on a map. So this is actually Germany over here. And the reason I've got Germany up here is because they are the largest consumer of renewable energy in the world at the moment. They have a lot of solar. Last summer they managed to produce on a few days half their power from solar. Okay, they made a significant investment. If you look at it, it's, well, it's kind of blue-ish. And so what this tells us is it's actually not a very good place for solar, okay? And if you look at our map, it's fantastic some of the best in the world. And as a comparison, if you had a one kilowatt solar system and you installed it in Frankfurt, you'd get 850 kilowatt hours of electricity from that. And if you did it in Edmonton, you'd get 1,250 kilowatt hours. So 50% more here in Alberta. There's reasons why we don't take advantage of it, but I'll get into that later. The other factor within the uh, system is we have what's known as a power pool. You know, this Kids here in the pool are getting along nicely and having fun. We know what a wheat pool is. We're used to that here. And we know what the stock market is. And the power pool is very similar to the stock market. Here what happens is that since deregulation, if you're a generator, you basically offer up the price, your, your power onto the market, okay, at a price. If the price isn't good enough, you can shut your generation off and save your fuel or whatever till the price comes up, okay? This is the argument that TransAlta is in with um, the MSA at the moment, is that they're accusing TransAlta of shutting off generation when there's a peak demand, and when the price goes up, bring on generation, okay? And falsely manipulating the market, okay? So here's a couple of shots off of I have an app, because I'm just that geeky. I have an app for the pool price, so this is a 2.30 in the morning when I guess I couldn't sleep. This is at noon on a day. So you can kind of see the difference in the prices. Here it's, and this is wholesale price. This is not what you pay, but this is the wholesale price. And you can see here how it fluctuates, okay? Between two and a half cents, one and a half cents, and here two and a half cents and five cents, okay? And so this is the way it's supposed to work, okay? As demand goes up, the price goes up, you know, and things like that. So it's really the concept that I want you guys to get, not the details so much. And here's, this, the marginal prices, where they kind of settle on a price. So this is again July 31st, when they were warning about power outages and all this kind of stuff. And you can see the price variation. So at five o'clock, the power's worth $760, okay? But here at 
10 o'clock at night, it's down to $45. Okay, so it's quite, that's quite a range in price. Okay, and that's typically what happens when you get close to the peak demand, because when you need electricity, they'll pay anything. Now, it, it's capped at $999. You can't go above that, okay? But it does get up there fairly often. What happens when you get your bill, you get a monthly pool price, retail, okay? So what you see, your eight, 10, 12 cents a kilowatt hour, that's a pooled price spread out over the whole month. So daytime, nighttime, weekends, okay? So that's why it's relatively low compared to this, okay? If you're an industrial user, and you're trying to do something and you need a lot of electricity at a moment, sometimes they're tied directly into the grid and they'll pay close to wholesale price. So for them it matters, okay? This is days of the week, this away. I had to cut this off because it was way too huge. This is hours of the day, so this is basically noon. This is July 31st in here, okay? So what this is, is this is the peak load forecast report. So the green areas is obviously good no problem here. You get up to people start going to work and the power demand starts coming up, okay? So the color changes. It starts creeping up into the close to 100, okay? But as then it takes a breather here and then it climbs again and then we hit the max here, 100%. We peak out, okay? And the, the risk with this is that then they start calling for rolling blackouts or brownouts or something like that. And seriously, I wasn't kidding actually, if you do happen to live in a high rise and they blackout that part of the city, you are stuck in the elevator. And I do know people that that happened to. Grid, I call it the grid, they call it the Alberta Integrated Electricity System, because it's a fancier name. I'm not gonna get into details of this, it's not that exciting. It's basically the wires that go from the generator to your home, okay? Again, I mentioned there's no storage. But balancing the supply and demand, this is a highly complex thing. It's just not a simple thing, okay? And so this is, for this reason, the grid is actually regulated. We have deregulated electricity in Alberta, except for this. This is completely and totally regulated, okay? And it's because if you didn't do that, if you lived in the country, you wouldn't get power half the time because it's not worth it. If, if you're in it for the money, for the market reasons, you wouldn't sell power to the country. You'd so just sell power to the city or sell power to whoever wants to pay for it. And so it's totally regulated. And because of that, we all pay for it. And what that matters to us is it shows up in your electricity bill. And whether you like it or not, you're gonna pay for this. And so when you're looking at cutting your electricity bill down, you have to understand that part of it. In terms of EPCOR, the part of EPCOR, the, the EPCOR company that actually does this is technically known as EDTI, which is Edmund EPCOR Distribution Transmission, Inc. It's a separate company from the water company. It's a separate company from the retailer. It's all called EPCOR, okay? All shows up on the same website, okay? They basically do the yellow strip here, okay? So you have the generation here, you have your homeowner here, and they're the transmission guys in between. Okay. In terms of what is the ratio in Alberta between residential people, businesses, farmers, all this kind of stuff. In 2012, this is also from the AESO report, but it's courtesy of the ERCB. Um, so in 2012, the population in Alberta for residential, this is not the people, but the number of residential properties that are using electricity, 1.3 million-ish, okay? 83,000 farms, 167,000 commercial, and just under 40,000 industrial. But when you look at the consumption, this is in gigawatt hours. So residential uses 9,500 9 gigawatt hours. Farmers, eh, about, about a quarter of that. But there's only 83,000 of them, and there's 1.3 million residential. Okay, so the farmers proportionally use a lot of electricity. Commercial, it's about 8% of the residential, but they use 50% more electricity. But industrial, they use the big chunk, okay? 
So that's the other thing to keep in mind. I think when most people think about electricity, they think, ah, oh, well, I'm a homeowner. There's like four million Albertans almost, and you know, we must use a, most of the electricity. Well, that's actually not true. This is from the AESO as well, future forecasts, okay, as part of their planning. So a lot of this is um, out to 2032, which is 15 years, 20 years in the future. This line here is farmers, so they don't anticipate much growth in the farm. The thickness of the line is pretty much the same. Uh, residential, uh, sorry, this is commercial, a little bit thicker, so uh, that makes sense, you know, population growth. We're going to have a little bit more commercial uh, people here, um, so there's a little bit more growth there. Uh, the residential is the green, uh, pretty much the same as commercial, right, and uh, it's also probably due to population growth. Um, they separate industrial here, they split it in two. Uh, industrial by itself, a little bit of growth, a little bit higher than what uh, the population growth would be uh, proportionally to this, but the huge growth, oil sands. So this is where a lot of the growth is going to occur in the consumption of electricity. Now in the oil sands they also co-generate a lot, okay, because they need steam for their processes, okay. They also, within the plants they actually use electricity to heat the pipes. I don't know if people, many people know that. They have a very sophisticated heat, heating system that actually heats the pipes, but they use electricity to do that. Now they are producing steam with natural gas, and so they have this excess of steam, and so they make electricity with it. And then actually the challenge Fort McMurray has is they actually have too much electricity. And so now they're building transmission lines to the Fort McMurray area, not to send them electricity, but to get it back from them, okay? A couple of years from now, you're going to look at your bill and go, oh, wow, that seemed to jump a little bit. And this is the reason why. I think everybody's realized that they're building this massive transmission line between Edmonton and, and Sherwood Park. Anybody who's been out in Anthony Handy can see it. Quite a bit of controversy around building it. This is one of the reasons it's controversial. This is for the whole province, all the rate pairs. Um, 2013, we're running here like probably $27, $28 uh, per megawatt hour. And five years from now, it's going to be up over 40. And in another couple of years after that, probably 45. And this is forecasted by the AESO. The guys who plan the transmission expansion have forecasted this. Okay, so the people who are going and getting the thing built and convincing people to build it knowingly know that this is what's going to happen. Okay, because this is part of their forecast. As a residential, customer. This is what they consider to be an average residential customer. I don't see too many that are this low, actually. I see most people are above this, but whatever. Here they're saying about $18 in 2013. Five years from now, 30, approaching $35 in 2020 or 2021. It's basically going to double in five years. Okay? That's, that's far from the rate of inflation. Okay, and you don't have any choice in the matter. It's done. You're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for this for 50 years. This is one of the problems with this. This is considered an infrastructure upgrade, and infrastructure tends to be spread across a lot of years. Okay, so whether you like it or not, you're part of the ride. In terms of the pie charts again, the way the the transmission costs break down, ratios break down. As I mentioned, industrial is the big piece of the pie. Commercial is about quarter, residential 18, farm four. The way that you pay for this is a little bit different. So big industrial customers pay differently than you guys do. Um, I'm not sure where you want to saw it off as to what's fairer than the other, but you got to keep in mind that what industry does and what commerce does, commercial operations do, is they create jobs. And when governments, whenever you listen to a politician talk, they always talk about job creation, okay? So if a large, heavy industry that uses a lot of electricity wants to relocate to another province or something because the electricity costs are too high, politicians sit up and take notice, okay? So they're paying their share, but they pay in a different way, okay? So their energy costs are about two-thirds of their bill. Transmission is about a third. You guys... I'm assuming everybody here owns a home. Most people do. Your energy costs are 40% of your bill. Okay? So when, most, when I talk to most people, that's what they think their bill is. So when they cut it down, the rest of it, they're stuck. This is all fixed costs. 
Okay? Later on, I'll explain the bill to you to show you that this actually isn't fixed. You can actually, if you cut your consumption down, you cut all this down. Okay? This is the other last factor, which is a bit unique to Alberta, because we have to be different. Um, it's, it's known as a specified gas emission regulation, blah, 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 blah. Really what it is is a carbon tax on heavy polluters, which is the coal industry in Alberta. So anybody who emits over 100,000 tons of carbon a year gets hit with a tax. It's 12% on the top 12% of the emissions. Not all your emissions, just the top 12%. Okay, and it's, sorry, I said 12% and 12%. It's $15 a ton on the top 12% of the emissions. Okay, so the government was reviewing that. They were looking at maybe doubling it up. $30 a ton for the top 24% of the emissions. So the concept when they first introduced it was that if you tax the top, it will force the utilities or encourage the utilities to reduce create efficiencies, cut down their greenhouse gas emissions. It's all good, right? Helps with climate change. But as you can see from this, this is from the Pema Institute, it actually hasn't had any effect. It stayed the same. And so what does this mean? Well, they just pass it to you. So it's a carbon tax that they pay and they pass to you. It's not doing what it was intended to do. It's not reducing the emissions, okay? It's not reducing greenhouse gases, okay? If they can afford to pass it on to you and you don't notice, and you don't squawk about it, they'll just do it. It's just a cost of doing business, okay? So now we're gonna to get to the bill. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? It's pretty boring. Did I explain it well enough? Did it, does it make kind of ish sense, okay? It's a lot more complicated than that, but. So your bill, how does this actually show up? So you have a bill, it doesn't look like this. This is from Medicine Hat. Medicine Hat owns their own utility, but not the way Edmonton owns their own utility. Medicine Hat sees it as kind of a, a tool for change, okay? So they structure their bill this way. Every line item is tied to a consumption amount, okay? The reason there's two here is because it's, the bill's red, the meter is red, partway through a month. So they have one amount for one part of the previous month, this amount for the current month, okay? So, but as you see, um, this is the electricity side, Everything except one is based on the consumption. Gas, everything here is based on consumption. Water, everything is based on consumption. So what does this tell you as a consumer? If you use less, you pay less. This is what this tells you. The structure is exactly the same at Edmonton, except they don't format the bill that way. Okay. So you see here a consumption amount that you use. This is my bill. I don't, I'm not an Epcor customer anymore. So when I was an Epcor customer, this was my bill a couple of years ago. I didn't use very much electricity this month, 97 kilowatt hours. Okay, I have to stop doing that because it drives the mic crazy. Again, what they do here is because it's, if you look at your bill right here, it says residential RRO. Does anybody know what RRO is? Nobody? Which? Could be rural road, yep, township, something like that. It actually stands, in this case, it stands for regulated rate option. Okay, well, do you think, well, it's regulated. What does this make any sense? We have deregulated electricity. When deregulated electricity first came along, there's a lot of unscrupulous people went to people's doors, knocked on their door, sold them some long-term contracts, locked them into it, okay? And so people shied away from signing contracts after that. And so in the Edmonton area, it's quite unique for the province about 80% of the people in Edmonton stick with this, which is known as the regulated rate option. And so because of this, the price fluctuates every month. What EPCOR has to do is they have to apply to the AUC for a rate increase. So they forecast what the power is gonna be in a couple of months, okay? They ask for that rate for that month. And then if it turns out that it's not quite that rate, they adjust it afterwards, okay? And so this makes for a highly complicated bill in a lot of ways, okay? So you have you, they read it on May 17th, and they read it on April 18th, okay? So they're in the middle of the month, but the price is by the month. So the price changes May 1st to May 30th, April 1st to April 30th. So on the bill, two different amounts, depending on the month you're in, two different prices, depending on the month you're in. You have an administration charge. Why didn't they start doing this just to drive me crazy? 
they start offering credits and they bill you back and then they give you a credit and then they bill you back. And anyway, what you see in here is a microgen. Most of you, if you don't have solar in your house, you won't see this. So when I generate electricity with solar, this is where it shows up in my bill. So I used 97 kilowatt hours this month. In April, I generated 160 plus, and in May, I generated 180. So almost 330 kilowatt hours that month. So I get a credit and a credit. The credit I get is the same as what I pay. I get charged, okay? So I get a $16 credit. What drives me crazy with an upcore bill, and I could totally get it from their side, they send you one bill for all the utilities. It's great for them, makes it easy. Makes it easier for you guys to make one payment. Problem with it is, I've got this credit, I don't see it, because last month I paid $100, okay? So I don't actually see the benefit of having solar on my house, because it just disappears. It goes to my water bill. Pays off my water bill, pays off my drainage bill. That's where my credit costs. The other thing that I don't like about this, is in the delivery, most people think, okay, that's, that's what I pay for electricity. I pay six cents a kilowatt hour, or maybe 11 and a half. That's quite a leap, actually, between two months. What, they also put it down here, 97 kilowatt hours. And why is that? Well, because it's just like Medicine Hat. The distribution charge, the transmission charge, forget these riders, and the local access fee, they're all based on your consumption. So these are not fixed costs, okay? These are actually tied to your consumption. So these, you can drive down. If you look at the transmission co costs here, it's only a dollar. Paid a dollar one month for transmission costs. This first one, the distribution charge, this is from EPCOR on their website. So this is all public information. It's on the AUC's website, it's on the EPCOR's website. Good luck trying to find it. The distribution charge is two parts for the residential. Does anybody have a business here? Because it gets really goofy. It gets goofy with businesses. I could spend an hour just on that. Anyway, per site per day, this charge is what it costs you to have a meter. That's your me daily metering charge. Every day you pay, in this year, almost 50 cents to have a meter. Every day. And then they hammer you with a little bit of extra consumption in here. Why? I don't know. Maybe to pay for the metering guys. It's a user fee. And then they have this thing. It's called a system access service schedule. But wait a minute. I don't see that anywhere on the bill. What the hell? Where is that? Well, because they changed the wording. This is your transmission charge. Why they call it system access when it's really transmission? Only an engineer would know. Is there any engineers in the crowd? Hope they're not offended by that, but it's probably true. There's only one line on him here for transmission. It's totally based on your consumption. So if you drive your consumption to zero, you have no transmission charge on your bill. Local access fee is not regulated by the AUC. It's by the city that you live in or the county that you live in or whatever. It's a municipal taxes they apply to your bill and it pays the city of Edmonton for you, the power line crossing from the power pole to your house. When it crosses the sidewalk, that's city property. And they charge you for that. It's obviously more in depth than that, but that's actually the fee. Now in the case of the city of Edmonton, it's totally tied to your consumption. So if you drive your consumption to zero, your local access fee goes to zero. If you live in Shore Park, it's a flat fee. So just to recap, this is a current bill. No, it's not, because the administration charge is wrong. So this is still my bill, yes, from 2011. So it used to be $5.86. It's jumped up to $5.91. If you do the math, that's $71 a year. And the distribution charge, the metering fee, if you do the math here at 50 cents a day, it's $181 a year. So you add the two together, and you get $252 a year. This is your fee that you pay is fixed for one year that you can't avoid. That's your minimum amount you're going to pay for electricity. You can generate all the you like, you're still going to pay this. Okay? I would call this a disincentive. 
against efficiency. Okay? I think if you drive your bill to zero, it should go to zero. Okay? The, everybody else should pay for it. Since we're all sharing the costs, the heavy consumers should pay for this. It's because otherwise, why would they ever change? Why would they ever improve their efficiencies? Drive the consumption down. Because this is one of the problems that we have. They're building up the transmission system because they think that we're just going to use more and more and more and more every year. There's no place in that equation for efficiencies. We could cut it. We, as population grows, we could match that population growth with efficiencies. We could keep it the same. But that doesn't make anybody any money. This is another bill from another company that I'm with now. It's a small uh, retailer. So on the retail side, you can choose whoever you like to send you your bill. That is totally deregulated. It's the most competitive within the whole deregulation system because even small companies can get started in this. So this is a little co-op that I belong to called Spark Your Power. Oops. <clears throat> they, they pass. <clears throat> Excuse me. They pass on the delivery charge from Epcor. They just roll it into one line. And the reason for this is because Epcor charges them. So Epcor gets paid for the transmission anyways. Okay. They're, 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 they always get paid for this. They own the wires. Um, but in this case, I have a pretty healthy credit. $62 for one month. Because this month, I'm on a flat, flat fee, which is what I like about it. It's seven and a half cents a month each month, every month, very predictable, okay? So it's easy to budget for and stuff like that. And, uh, and my microgen credit here is, I think I produce 900 kilowatt hours one month. So I consume and I generate. Why? Because I can't generate at night. So at night, I have to buy power from the utility. And so this is what, I, if, I don't think I mentioned this before, but I'm not talking about battery-based systems. This is grid-tied systems. This is the normal around the world, the standard. What you do is you buy and sell back and forth to the utility. Okay? You get a special meter. It measures the electricity flow in both directions. When they come to read the meter, they read both. Okay? They put both in your bill. And unfortunately, for a little while there, these guys were actually paying me 15 cents for what I generated and sold. But the government didn't like that. So now they're not allowed to do that anymore. So now it's market price. So what they charge me here, they have to pay me here. Okay? What Spark has is a, is a program at the moment now is uh, for those people who want to encourage green energy, they can pay two cents a kilowatt hour on their consumption, much like Bullfrog does. And then the, the money that that generates goes out to people who actually have microgeneration. So I get a check every quarter for the power that I generate, okay? So renewable energy. Has anybody got any questions about the bill? Does that make sense? Yes. Sir. How typical is that for compared with rural electric? When you say typical. Uh, In terms of how the billing is structured? I don't know. If you had your bill with you, I could certainly tell you. I would, I would guess that the REAs so in Alberta, we have what's known as a rural electrification associations. So in the good old days, when it first started, the guys in the country had no power, bugger all, right? So they had to build the systems themselves. So they got together, like co-ops, formed these what are known as rural electrification associations and built their own transmission lines and supplied power to all their customers. When they did that, then the big boys came along and said, well, okay, now you've got everybody hooked up, we can help you with that, right? But they wouldn't touch them at first. So this was, the, this was the concern around the transmission going deregulated. In terms of the way an REA structures the bill, I don't honestly know. It depends on the REA. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Conceptually, it should be exactly the same. It should all be tied to your consumption, okay? Except for some fixed charges, okay? But your REA may have some. Sometimes if they have to make an investment, a long-term investment, then they may want you to pay that back through your bill. Somehow. The way you described the EPCOR bill, though, uh, driving down consumption also drove down the uh, transmission charges you right. on the things you have to buy. Right. right. That I didn't realize was the case. No, most people don't. Most people don't. Um, no, it's just hidden. No, the question was, was um, that he didn't realize that this actually was 
something you could affect, your transmission charge. This line here, you know, you just thought it was fixed. Is that basically what you're saying? Everybody does. You pay for transmission charges, but you don't get that when you, when you sell them. Right. Okay, yeah, no, that's the question. That's the point I hadn't come up to yet. But yes, you don't get paid if you sell power to the grid. You don't get paid for transmitting it, okay? So because you don't own the wires, you're the generator, okay? Capital Power, who generates the coal power, they don't get paid this, okay? They get paid this. They get paid this much. This is the generation. This is why the microgen is there. This is for the generation. This is for the transmission. So the company that owns the wires gets this. This is the deregulated part of it. So this is the three parties. You've got the generator, the transmission company, and then the company that sends you the bill. OK, does that make sense? So you, as you described it, you can affect. You can affect us, yeah. If you look at the Medicine Hat bill, because they actually want you. So Medicine Hat wants you to conserve energy. They want you to do that. And why? Because they own their own utility. If you use more electricity, you have to build more power plants. That's not cheap. They know they want to encourage you to actually save power because it saves them money. And since you're a taxpayer as well, it also saves you money that way too. So you save it as a rate payer, you save it as a taxpayer. So they put everything so that it's dead obvious that everything is tied to consumption. The other guys, yeah, can't be bothered. Does that answer the question? Somebody else had a hand up? Uh, yeah, I got one. So I have four million shows to uh, Yep. I just couldn't tell if that was on your Spark bill or not. Uh, yeah, so what Spark tries to do is they try and make the bill a little simpler. So instead of it being, you know, all this, they just lump it into one line. Now they have a, so it's an internet based bill, and they have a button I can click on, and I get a data dump, okay? And this line, Epcor probably puts, 120 lines of stuff together. So, and what they do, which drives me completely psychotic, is that they do this debit credit, debit credit, debit credit, debit credit, debit credit, debit credit. So sometimes they, it's like they make a mistake and bill you for something, and then they realize, oh no, I didn't make a mistake, and then they bill you for it again, and then they credit it for you, and then they bill you for it again, and then they credit it for you. After a while, you give up after 40 lines, and you stop looking at your bill. And I don't know if that's deliberate, I would like to think it's not. Depends. They're not making it simple. Yes? If I understand the question, so I, I think what he's trying to ask me is, in some jurisdictions in the world, depending on how much electricity you use, the rate goes up. So they have tiered power charges, okay? So if you use a little bit, you pay a low rate. As soon as you make, use a little bit over that, it, the rate jumps. California does this, okay? So if you use enough electricity, all of a sudden, instead of paying six cents a kilowatt hour, you're paying 40. So what this is, this is a disincentive to overconsume electricity. So you run around, you turn all your lights off, and you, you know, yell at your kids a lot, yell at your teenagers, right? Um, because they don't ever turn the lights off. And so jurisdictions who want you to conserve electricity do stuff like that. In Alberta, we don't do that. We keep the energy costs low, what appears to be low, okay, and uh, keep it a little bit complicated. But it's coming that way, I would say, because the deregulated part of it, the challenge is, is that nobody wants to invest because it's a huge capital outlay for a long period of time. And if it's not regulated, you're not guaranteed a return on your investment. And so what happens is that people stop building generation capacity. And this is a challenge we have right now in Alberta, is that there's no generation being built, okay, because nobody wants to build it because they don't know sure they're going to get paid back on it. Now on the other side, the regulated part, which is the transmission line, they just build transmission lines willy-nilly. They, they increase the transmission capacity five-fold, 500%. That's not rate of inflation. That's not even the rate of population growth. They just felt that they're going to need 500% more capacity for the next 50 years. Now, if they're wrong, you pay for that. Okay? That's the problem. And I'll show you, and this is what's happened around the world, okay, in those areas where they use a lot of renewable energies, Germany in particular, the challenge they're having right now is the utilities that do the transmission lines 
are going bankrupt. And it's because when Germany wanted to go renewable energy, they thought, this is just goofy. Who wants to do that? We'll just burn coal and do things the way we always did things. And then all of a sudden, solar started to become cheap and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And now all of a sudden, it's not only cheaper, but there's no pollution, none of this stuff. Okay? And so all of a sudden, everybody wants more solar and more renewable, and nobody wants coal. So the guys who have made an investment in coal over 50 years all of a sudden realize, hey, I'm not going to get paid back for that investment. So I need to pay it, get it paid back over 30 years. So what does that do? If you're paying 50 cents a day over a 50-year amortization, then all of a sudden you've got to pay $1.50 a day for a 30-year amortization. So your bills start going through the roof. And that's what's happening in Germany. Because it's not the renewables. It's the grid. It's the transmission side of it. And the traditional baseline generation are going out of business because they, if they were regulated and they were forced to charge a fixed rate, they wouldn't be able to pay back their investment because they didn't think about it when they did this. And this is one of the risks when you do this. When you do business as usual, and the newspapers see this today, the newspapers never saw the internet coming. Okay. Well, you look at the news today, and all the newspapers are in trouble. And TV's coming next, right? And they all are in a panic, right? They see it. What's happening on the energy side is they don't get it yet, okay? They, but they're starting to, okay? There's a panic afoot in California on the utility side, okay? And there's a panic afoot in Germany and in parts of Europe on the utility side, okay? These guys have made some huge investments based on a premise that they were going to get a certain payback for a certain period of time, and it's not happening. Okay? And so they're in a big panic. Okay? And you can't just have a utility go bankrupt on you, because then the lights go out. Okay? So if you're a politician, you have a problem. And that's what Germany is dealing with now. They're actually trying to slow down the spread of renewable energy because they can't keep up. It's, it's a disruptive technology, just like the internet. And you can try and throw up roadblocks. The problem with solar is that it's, it's democratizing the grid. It's distributed. You put it on your house, you're the generator. You own it, OK? And I'm going to say Epcor, but it's you know, whatever the utility in Germany is. Epcor can come along and do something about that. Okay, they're stuck. You own it. They can try and cut you off, but you vote. Okay, I hope you all vote. Does everybody here vote? Um, so that makes a difference in the end. We still live in a democracy, right? But these are things that people need to realize. And this is one of the problems that I have with the system in Alberta is because it's so complex and it's so hidden that it's hard for you, the regular people, to keep up with it, right? Because it just disappears in your bill. Energy is relatively cheap here. The utilities are very good at the, their job. The lights rarely go off here. You know, I don't want to knock them for that. They've done an excellent job of that. But we're at a period in time in history when things are changing, and they're refusing to see the change. And the problem with that is we all get to pay for that. And so this is what happens. If you don't have the knowledge of what's happening, <clears throat> you don't realize it, and you're going to get stuck with the bill in the end, okay? And so this is the situation we're at right now. Now, it hasn't gotten to the point where the utilities are playing hardball yet, but, I mean, there was an article on CBC Radio last week where a, a guy bought an acreage that was classified as a farm. He got nailed for $5,000 on his bill, electricity bill, that he was arguing he shouldn't have. And the utilities basically said, so? They're a multinational company. They don't care. They want their five thousand dollars. Okay, so that it could get to that. It's it's really getting ugly in California, and it's kind of getting ugly in Germany. In Germany, it's a little bit easier because most citizens are hugely supportive of renewable energy. It's the government that's getting a little nervous. Okay, in California, maybe the same. Rob could might be speak to that better, but um, it's becoming an issue, and it's getting dirty. 
a lot of these utilities uh, have a lot of money, you know. So, anyway, anybody else got any questions? Yeah, I don't want to get too political about this. Yeah, yeah the question is about the, what the program in Ontario, and I don't really want to talk about it too much because I don't have all the time in the world, but just as a brief overview. So what Ontario brought in was a, a incentive program which is very similar to what Germany did. It's what's called a feed-in tariff. And so what you do is you guarantee a price of electricity per kilowatt hour at a fixed fee for a fixed rate of return, for a fixed period. And so it's 20 year term. So when you first get into it, the incentives were high to get people to start doing it. And as more and more people got into it and all the people in the chain got better at it and the, uh, the prices should go down, okay? And so they would do price adjustments. So it started out at 81 cents a kilowatt hour, 81 for 20 years. And the difference in Ontario is you get two meters. One is for pure export. You sell 100% of what you generate, okay? And for homeowners, it was capped at 10 kilowatts. It's hard to put more than 10 kilowatts on a house. So basically for homeowners, you got, they, they skewed it so that the voters got the sweet part of the deal, okay? So homeowners and farmers got 10 kilowatts. Everybody else got a little bit less and the high price. Then as, what happened was the price was too high. So it stayed high, the price of the equipment started to drop, drop and drop and drop and drop, and then the government was basically overpaying for what they should have done. And they didn't have a market correction. They didn't have a price correction in there, okay? So they kept paying at 81 cents. At the same time, there was a player in there what's known as the Ontario Power Authority, and they're, they know nuclear and they know hydro. They don't know renewables, okay? And they roadblocked all of it. So it backed up for years, okay, four or five years. And then the Tory party was gonna cancel the whole thing when they got elected, okay? And so every time an election came, everybody freaked out and thought they were gonna lose it all, okay? So we went, we've been, they've been through two elections in Ontario now, and it's still there, okay? But the price is now 31, 32? I think it's 30, 38? So it's 38 cents. So now they've... Right, so they only have a, a price correction. So what they do now is they just issue contracts on a regular basis at a different price to drop that down. And they're, they're starting to deal with the backlog with OPA. But that's one of the problems, right? Everybody thought, well, we're spending all this money on all this solar, and where is it? I don't see any of it here, right? And it's because of that. And this is a poor policy development from the government. They made a mistake. They were told not to do it that way, and they did it anyway. And so they made a mistake, and they didn't pay for it because they still got elected. But uh, yeah, it kind of made a mess of things. And this is why I don't, I don't mind the system in, in Alberta. One of the things is in Alberta is that it's totally deregulated. And so it's actually, we don't have those hindrances from the government, okay? You don't have a bureaucrat deciding policy and saying, nope, sorry, this is the only way you can do it. So in a way, we have a great system in Alberta. It's very simple, all that kind of stuff. And I should get to it before I run out of time. <laughs> 